So thanks a lot for the in invitation. It's really beautiful here. I guess I don't need to tell you. There's a stark difference from what I'm used to in the Be'er Sheva. Uh, it's nice to feel like sort of real winter. Uh, not Canada winter, but still. So um, let's begin. So what I've been studying ever since I started my academic career is uh, episodic memory. So episodic memory refers to memory for events that took place in a specific time and place, so in a specific spatial temporal context. And the scientist who coined this term is uh, Endel Tolving, who also defined episodic memory as kind of memory that is accompanied by what is called autonomous, autonomic consciousness, this ability to sort of reinstate, relive a past experience in a first-hand, first-person perspective. And what, uh, so this term was also coined by uh, Andrew Kulvin. And the nice way of looking at what episodic memory is, is term uh, mental time travel. So a episodic memory system enables us sort of go back in time in our own minds and relive, we experience, we experience uh, past events that occur to us. So again, we're talking about events that occurred in a specific time and place. And like, as an example, the event depicted in the picture you see here, it's my twins quite a few years ago, in an afternoon in Tuscany, we went to the park, saw an event that took place in a certain time and place. And, um, but in the lab, we often study episodic memory by looking at many events. So many events can be really, really small events like short video clips and even words in the list, okay? Because that word or that image or whatever was studied in a specific time and place. So it is a very tiny but still an episode that we might be able to encode to our memories. So today I'm actually going to speak about the most recent line of research in my lab, which I'm really most excited about. Uh, not published yet, very like, uh, very fresh. But just to give you a sense of how I got to study what you can think of more social aspects of memory, uh, I'll give you a really, really short description of my journey so far. Some of my the images you see, by the way, was, were created using, using a DALI. So I'm joining the trend. You can see to be using it in all presentations, so me too. Um, OK, so I began during my PhD in the, and after by studying the cognitive and neurocognitive aspects or processes underlying encoding and retrieval to episodic memory using mostly fMRI but also behavioral methods. Um, 
I then moved on during my postdoc to study processes that occur between encoding. You can think of them as processes that occur between encoding and retrieval, and specifically, specifically processes that result in forgetting. So we developed, together with Mars Moskovich and other colleagues, we developed a theory of forgetting. We call it the representation theory of forgetting, which very generally uh, explains what would be the factors causing forgetting. So in some cases, forgetting would be caused due to simple delay over time. In other cases, forgetting occurs due to interference by similar information we acquired after learning. And our theory tries to give predictions and elucidate the cases in which each of these factors would cause forgetting. And the main idea, that's why it's called the representation theory of forgetting, is that whether delay or interference would result in a, would be the factor underlying forgetting has to do with the underlying memory representation, the underlying cognitive and neural memory representation. And most recently, this study of forgetting got me interested in what we know about our own forgetting. So assessing our very own memory and we so I've discovered, the same sort of because there were hints in the in literature before, that there's an interesting bias. So even when we don't forget anything, or we forget very little, we, we underestimate our memory following a following delay, and we, we're less confident in our memory even when we don't forget anything or almost anything. So that has to do with what I call meta-forgetting, assessing our own memory processes, and that got me interested in what I'll talk about today, which is how we assess or evaluate other people's memories. So, oh, and by the way, feel free to interrupt with questions as we go along. Um, challenge my working memory capacities, I think so. Uh, so, just to take a step back, um, now I'm going to talk about my current line of research, but like just to put things in context. <coughs> humans have the, human, maybe other animals as well, but talking about humans today, have the ability to learn from others, a very important ability to learn from others. So one way to think about it, and we all, uh, I'm sure you all heard of uh, the GPT, chat GPT and all these, speaking the right place, right? Or uh, like uh, learning, uh, deep learning and methods like that. They learn differently from the way we do. One of our unique uh, features, can think about that is features of humans is that we're able to learn relatively quickly, sometimes even one shot learning, if someone else explains things to us, okay? And so are you talking about learning by observation or just like a verbal instructions? Because I think these are different. Yeah, yeah I'm sp speaking about uh, verbal instructions. Okay. It's not so much about the observation. I'll, I'll give an example. So there's lots of work on this from very different sources. So from Selo had a, has done a lot of work. There's a very interesting paper in BBS from just a few years ago that gives an example of such symbolic learning. And also Josh Tenenbaum, I hope is his name, right? Uh, does a lot of work on this idea that humans learn differently than uh, deep learning models. And just as an example, I think it's easy, easiest to understand the, the example. So my son you just saw in the picture is now 10, and he's super interested in politics. So he keeps asking me questions like how things work. It's a very depressing time to be interested in politics. But, uh, so like if he, if he asks me, how did we determine, how does the system determine who the prime minister is? I can explain it to him in one sentence, whereas GPT, I tried, I asked GPT, I can show you that few slides later on. I asked GPT, it doesn't learn the same way, right? It learns from a ton of examples, from being exposed to uh, a large amount of uh, 
of data and text, and actually it doesn't give accurate answers regarding that question. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you, or others have convinced you before, that a lot of what we learn is not all, but a lot of what we learn and about, about knowledge base is from social interactions, from other people explaining, telling uh, stuff to us. Specifically, a lot of what people talk about and hence learn from is episodic memories. So we engage a lot of our conversations have to do with sharing memories with others. Uh, again, an example from my, my kids, I have twins, a boy and a girl, and a younger one. Um, so my daughter started a new school recently. And when I think about it, a lot of what I know about that school, about the teachers, about the new friends, about what they do, what they learn, and so on, is from her descriptions, from her episodic memory, from her stories about what happened during the day. So, so given that episodic memories have an important role, I think, in our knowledge base, episodic memories, others' episodic memories, there's sort of a paradox, paradox here. Because we know, and there's a lot of work by many, Dan Schachter uh, perhaps is the most prominent figure in this aspect, showing that our memory is constructive rather than being like a video that plays, replays exactly the same uh, experience we, the same experience uh, we went through or experienced. Our episodic memories are constructive. They're, uh, they're not always accurate, and especially they uh, degrade over time. So on the one hand, they report they're an important source of information, but on the other hand, we can't always trust them. So how do they, we know? So I guess a way of thinking about, about it is that in order for the information conveyed via episodic memories of others, to be a useful and reliable source of information, we would think that we might have an ability to, humans might have an ability to assess others' memories, to say, okay, this sounds like something that really occurred, that sounds uh, uh, veridical, and this doesn't sound that veridical, and hence I won't give it a lot of weight, and maybe won't remember that information, uh, won't assign a lot of weight to it, and won't uh, use that information in the future. So, how do we, how are we able, to, so as I said, how are we able to assess others' memories? A first step of, in approaching this question is asking how we assess our very own memories. And it has been proposed by uh, Johannes Marr and uh, Siba, and others as well, that autonesis, this ability to reinstate a past experience from a first person perspective, is very important in our ability to assess our own memories. So we use this re experience of memories as a justification, and remember that word will come up very soon, as a justification for the veracity of our own uh, recollections. So again, think of an example if I'm trying to remember whether I locked the doors before the doors and windows before I left the house today. What would convince me that I really had, and I think I really had, um, is that I, I can reinstate the whole experience. I remember, yes, I locked the door and just as it uh, happened, I noticed the, the key, uh, it was hard to jiggle the key and had certain reports, uh, whatever, and uh, I can reinstate uh, whether it was cold, hot, and so on. So I can reinstate the whole experience in a lot of perceptual, uh, perceptual detail, and that provides good evidence for the fact that, yes, I, for reasoning that, yes, it seems like a real memory, like a veridical memory, I can trust my memory. So what I propose, and again, it's largely inspired by this work by uh, Johannes Marr, recently started working with a different project, is that 
We do the same or we do something similar when we assess others' memories. So I call this, I'll put everything on the slide now, I call this social net consciousness, social nesis, along the same lines as auto nesis. And the idea is that social nesis is our ability to relive another person's experience through like second or third hand perspective. Okay, so again, if my husband has, asks me, did you really lock the doors? I say, yeah, yeah, I remember, I remember I noticed the, the lock and needs to be repaired and you should do something about it. And I remember it was really cold and I was carrying a ton of things and so on. The more details, the more I can sort of share my, my experience, my re-experience of the event with him, the more convincing it is that this memory is indeed, is indeed accurate. So social analysis, I defined it is the ability to re relive a past event that another person experienced and joining in on their own alternate experience by self-projecting into that other person's experience. And here I sort of tried to sketch this idea. So if um, John asks Mary if Sarah was attended a party the day before, so Mary might remember that, yes, Sarah was there, she wore this beautiful <coughs> yellow dress, and she was late, and when she walked in, she suddenly noticed that Mary noticed the beautiful dress and so on. So this, what's here, we can think of as automatic consciousness, automatic content of, uh, used to justify, Sarah, uh, sorry, Mary uses to justify her very own memory, and she conveyed this, this, this automatic uh, content verbally by what they call certification. So we, we call, from now on, we call the person describing the memory, the witness. And on the other hand, there's the receiver, the person listening to the memory, and that person would justify what they, sorry, interpret this certification via engaging in what I call social ethic consciousness, which relies heavily on this idea of mentalizing. So, <coughs> mentalizing refers to reading someone else's mind, reading someone else's thought or attribution of mental states to another person and hence understanding that other person. But it, it seems that uh, for me, I mean, the, the important part is the fact that there are many details. But it's not necessarily that I can uh, vouch for, for each of these details. Just the fact that you tell me, I mean, if I ask you, okay, what have you done this morning? You give me very long details that makes me feel that you remember. Although I cannot really tell. I mean, it sounds right, but it's not like that. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure that uh, the fact that I, it seems uh, uh, something that I can, uh, what, what yeah, yeah. I think what I'm saying is that what I'm doing is mentalizing, like putting myself in the shoes of the other person and thinking, okay, if I remembered something with so much detail and really like experienced the event through the other person's eyes, then, then it would probably be something that really happened. Like, so is, is the important part the level of the details or the actual details? Uh, when you tell your yeah. husband, look, I locked because remember the door, I mean, there is some common memory that he can say, ah, yeah, I mean, that sounds right, because there is some mutual experience. But if you tell me, yes, I think I locked the door because I did it, I mean, I said, well, yeah, it sounds right. I mean, you do remember a lot of details, but I don't know how to interpret these. The context is right. very different. Right, so so a lot of it, you're right, a lot of it depends on, on, the, on the interaction and like, I won't get to it at all now, but future, future plans are looking at the dialogue, not just what you'll see soon, which isn't really dialogue. But, but I guess both, and I'm happy to discuss it more later. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I exaggerated the, in that example. Yeah, but of course these memories are more prone to, such memories are more prone to interference. But, but still there's recency effect, so you remember more things that they, 
happened. So, so the waiter, remember, if you lock the door where you park the car, because you do it so often, is to give like <coughs> specific, unique. Uh, Yeah, okay, so an excellent question, and I'll get to it later on. We're not talking about, about faking, we're assuming, and later I'll explain why I think this assumption is, is okay. We're talking about honest, candid memory justifications, not about, not about lying. I think lying puts, changes, changes a whole lot, and I don't think what we're looking at is, is lying, and actually people, most people, don't lie that much. Uh, <laughs> most, uh, I said most people, I mean, it's, it, it, it all depends on motivation, okay? So, but, that, but that I'll speak about it towards the end where I can really say a bit, a bit more about the relation. I think this has to do with, the, with lying. But it, it, it seems like a, a common We're not, I'll show you the paradigm soon. We're not using a paradigm that gives any motivation to lie. That there's, there's really no reason to lie. So the assumption you're lie. trusting the latter. Yeah, the assumption is like people are cooperative in their justifications. Um, okay, so, but of course we, we can manipulate trust later on. Right now we read it for the very first steps. So, just to go back to this word justification, I promise you I mentioned again, and I kept my promise, you see that line, uh, was that, uh, so justification I regard as a verbal description of the automatic conscious, uh, automatic content on which the justification is based. And again, this might be adapted according to, where, to who we're talking to. Right. So, so how can we, we offer, uh, rationalize these uh, justifications? Luckily, uh, someone else has done it already in Dobbins, uh, Washington University in St. Louis, who is a collaborator on the project I'm just I'm going to show you soon. So he published not so long ago, and others uh, followed, work in which people were given a simple yes-no recognition test. So these are the tasks we have been, as memory researchers have been using for ages. Very boring task. People study lists of words and then are presented with the words they studied as well as uh, lures, foils, and I'm asked to say yes-no regarding each word, give recognition judgments, whether the word was studied or not. But what they did in this uh, study was add after each item that was uh, presented at retrieval, they asked participants to give a justification. They actually called, called it that. So why, did, why do you think uh, the word doctor is really on the list? I remember repeating doctor in my head because I remembered I had a doctor appointment. A doctor <coughs> appointment. Okay, so you read that and you say, well, it seems like uh, that person remembers this correctly. And what they did in that study was trying a very simple, uh, a, a very simple model, natural language processing model, to distinguish between justifications, uh, justifications given to what was what were hits, accurate memory decisions versus false alarms. Okay, and they manage here are the results. They managed using a really very simple model to reach, not perfect, but not bad performance in distinguishing between hits and false alarms, between accurate and inaccurate memories, using the verbal information conveyed in these justifications. And these justifications are more diagnostic of memory accuracy than other measures we, we tend to use, like confidence, even like reaction time, so the faster you 
the faster you react, the more light you use. <laughs> We remember that. Unforgettable. <laughs> 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 so, so usually there's a, there's a correlation. The faster we react, the more uh, likely the memory is to be accurate. So reaction time as well is less diagnostic. So, so these, these things are really diagnostic, uh, these justifications, these verbal uh, descriptions. And this work has even been done later on, was done on eyewitness uh, identification. So uh, why do you think that person was is a suspect and so on? And, and the bridge even better performance. So this, uh, the one reason in presenting the studies to show that how justifications might be able, how we might be able to operationalize justifications, but also because we use data from that experiment in what I'm going to present in just another slide. So just to sum up part of what we said, I said so far and present the questions we thought we would be able to at least partly answer with <coughs> that data set. And actually, um, disclaimer, this data was, was a pilot for for grant, uh, a grant I submitted recently, but it ended up, I think, interesting enough to be published in its own uh, right. So, hopefully published, when I, when I get to write it up. <laughs> so, uh, so these are what I think are some of the open questions with regard to how we assess others' memories. So we know machines are able to do it pretty well. By the way, uh, okay, never mind. Machines are, are able to do it pretty well, so we can train a model to distinguish between accurate and inaccurate memories, or between memories and imaginations, and have worked on that too. And maybe the first question, so we sort of have a benchmark. How good, how much of this information is diagnostic, is uh, conveys uh, conveys diagnostic information, so can humans use this information as well? Are there these this machines? Maybe even better. But more interestingly, interestingly is, uh, interesting is the, sec the second question, whether humans' assessment perhaps capture different aspects of the data. So whether they're sensitive to different features or different words of speech, whatever, then these models. And if this is the case, then we might be able to synergize this and augment natural language processing models with data from humans. So I promise to give an answer to all these questions, a first very preliminary answer to all these questions, and even one more. Uh, so what we did was we used the, the data from Ian Dobbins's uh, Experiment. It's not very rich data. That's why it was only supposed to be a pilot in the first uh, when we started out with this, but apparently that it turned out informative enough. So we chose justifications from 58 witnesses from Dobbin's study. We had to exclude some of the data because it was really, uh, either people didn't understand the, uh, uh, the instructions or reasons like that. From each, we had four justifications accompanied, accompanied to hits and four to false alarms, so accurate and inaccurate memories. And we ran, we ran the study on 174 receivers. So for each, each witness was assigned with three receivers. And these are the actual instructions of the test. Was uh, done online as everything done these days, almost everything. So people were explained with Ian Dobbins' experiment very, uh, very briefly, and were then asked to, were told that they would see these justifications on the screen for one person, and they had to judge whether the choice was correct or incorrect, break their confidence in their answer, and uh, 
so this this is what it looked like. So say well, the whether the answer give a binary decision correct or incorrect, and greater confidence. And in addition, we asked three additional questions. We chose very carefully, I can say, which we call opinion ratings. So there's sort of less explicit, less direct measures <coughs> of um, of people's uh, of receivers' assessments of these justifications. So the reason I say that we're chosen carefully because we try to think of specific questions we can ask where people would have an advantage over perhaps a mother uh, or would answer differently maybe. So, uh, so we ask whether the writer sounds confident in their description, whether the, the text is, seems general and specific, and, and is it vivid? And just going back to the second question I, I I presented before, the idea we think, the reason we think people with humans would be different in their assessments in the features they use to assess the memory is because, because we think the underlying process is different. A model just gets thrown a ton of data at and learns according to that data. Whereas humans, we think, engage in what, we, what they call social genetic consciousness and try to re-experience the event through another person's uh, eyes and hence, if the process is different, the result might also be different. So, <coughs> so these, are the, these are the results. We see what we can call a hit bias. So, so, these are, sorry, so these are the true outcomes, for a number of hits, and these are the percentage across all participants of hit choices. So we see a clear hit bias. People who believe other people are more accurate than they actually are. But this, this should be taken with a grain of salt because it might just have to do with the instructions. If we told them half of those are hits and half are false alarms, it might have been worked differently. And by the way, again, I don't think it's the same, but we, we see a proof bias in lie detection, lie assessment as well. So when we ask people to assess others lying, people tend to believe more than they should, should believe. Um, but we still see that people are able, not amazingly well, but are able to distinguish between hits and false alarms, namely the probability of choosing hit for an actual hit is higher than the probability of choosing hit for a false alarm. And also, we see that confidence rating, so we ask each receiver not only to say whether the, the memory is accurate or inaccurate, but also say how confident they are in their decision. So the more confident they are, the more likely they are to be correct. And this is truer for hits than for salams. So this is what we see in this interaction. So, just the take home message from this specific slide is that confidence seems to add some diagnostic value over and above the explicit, uh, the explicit assessment. Okay, these are the, the results. They might not be super, super impressive, but again, we're, we're using data here, which is really not optimal. So this, the justification I chose to, to present before was, was, was one of the better ones. A lot of them are, I remember this word because I remember it. I remember it. Because I remember thinking about it, because I, whatever. So, so we still see human classification accuracy is above chance. Again, talking about lies. In lie detection, people are terrible at lie detection. If they're even above chance, it's around 53%. So, so this is still even with this suboptimal data, they're way better, people are way better than taking lies. And 
Oh, so, so this number refers to a majority vote. So if two out of the three receivers chose a certain answer, that's the answer we took into account. And what we also did was train, retrain the model Ian Dobbins used in, the, in his study only on the, sub, on the set of data we used in the current experiment. And with this, with this uh, model, we got to a classification accuracy of 61%, again, but the chance. So it seems we're long uh, that humans and machines are not that different as far as classification accuracies, but do they capture the same features of these justifications? So here, just as an illustration, we see word bubbles where each the size of each word depicts how common it is of a certain outcome, whether it hits or false alarms. So what we see is the actual outcome, so just taking the actual data and plotting which words are most prominent or most common for hits and false alarms. Then we did the same for the classification of human weapons. So instead of the actual ground truth, hits versus the false alarms, what people say were hits versus false alarms, and the same for the language model. And what we see is certain features. When I say features here, I mean words. Certain words that are more that both humans and the language model are sensitive to and to capture and like remember, but we also see differences. So the word of here is way better captured by the language model than by humans. Humans is very small, you can probably see it probably from what you said. On the other hand, the word, we forgetting, yeah, the word because, which is we're diagnostic of hits. Humans are able to capture better than the language model. And the same way, even nicer, you can see in the, in the false alarm part of the, of the picture. So not. Yeah. So not is captured better by humans than by the model. The state is captured better by the model than by humans. So at least descriptively, and no, no statistics, no empirical statistics here, but at least statistics, uh, sportively, sorry, it seems like the language model and humans capture somewhat different aspects of the data. And and what we did was, okay, I'll return to that in a minute. Um, but what we also did, also what we're interested in is seeing whether perhaps these opinion ratings manage to distinguish better between accurate and inaccurate memories than the explicit direct assessment participants gave. So before we asked them how specific, how confident does the person sound, how specific it is, and how vivid the justification sounds. And we we try to predict whether the, the outcome based on these opinion ratings rather than the explicit assessments. And what we see that they, that they are better, that they see, at least descriptively, they are better. So, um, so if the direct assessment is only at around 58%, just taking confidence is way above that. So it seems like what people, people's indirect assessments are perhaps more informative or more diagnostic of the accuracy of memories than their actual explicit assessments, which is, I thought was very interesting. And going back to the comparison between the language model and humans uh, assessments, what we did is take the best model based only on humans, uh, humans' ratings, which was the model which included, actually what's quite striking, sorry, is the model which takes, which takes these three opinion ratings, as well as the interactions between them, but the interactions don't add that much. 
is the best model. So we don't even, what it means that we don't even have to ask people about their direct assessment, doesn't add any additional information. It's better to ask them those indirect questions. So we took the best human model and the language model and created an ensemble model which combines the two. And here, I really blew my mind. It reaches 70% 70 70, uh, classification accuracy, which is way better than what we saw earlier. And that means that really they're capturing humans and machines are capturing different aspects, somewhat different aspects uh, of the data and these are proportion tests uh, show that they're both better than each of them individually. So humans and machines come together. Um, Okay, I really have three more minutes, or eight. eight as many as I <laughs> well. Okay, so returning to the questions we asked earlier, are humans as good as machines? Yeah, and they, they seem to be just as good as machines, which in itself isn't such an interesting question. Just uh, are humans. I guess a more interesting way of putting this question, are humans able to do this? So yes, they are. Do humans capture different aspects of the data? Yes. And can we combine humans, data from humans, features from humans, and from models to, to augment these models? And the answer is, ooh, yes. And an additional answer, which we sort of didn't ask explicitly, unintended, but these indirect measures, these opinion ratings, might be, if this, at least in this data set, more informative and more diagnostic than direct measures. Okay. I'm being very consistent in keeping my promises. I promised I'll talk about lying or reliability. Is what we're capturing here about detecting if people are lying or not? We think not. I might not be very convincing, but, the, but we saw these justifications. There was no motiv motivation to lie. And I think in most, in most cases, if we're trying, maybe the example I gave with my husband isn't, isn't that good because maybe I am trying to lie to him, but, uh, but most of the times we're trying to convince, to really describe whether we remember accurately or, or not. We're not trying to show off on our memory capacities. If we don't remember, we're trying to justify, <coughs> yeah, I'm not sure I remember that. Okay? So, and we have justifications like those as well. I think, I'm not sure. So really what we're looking at, I believe, are candid memory justifications. If anything, we're talking about what Morris and Moscovich termed honest line in this they're in the context of the confabulations. So if we're giving inaccurate information, it's not because we, we intend or we have any motivation to lie. And, and one, of the reason, one of the ways in which I think this data is different from lying is that we, people are really bad at detecting lies. Okay, so if we manipulate what I call witnesses to lie in half of the cases, people are very bad at distinguishing between lies and between the truth and lies. And one of the things is that when we, one of the ways people lie is give a lot of details, okay? So, and that's, or even when, when, when people are convinced or when trust is manipulate, manipulated and people think Receivers think the witnesses might be lying. They they change the way they assess these kinds of uh, justifications or, or the way they assess their memories. Okay, the more details they give, the, the less they trust them. In contrast to what we see, so so there's a lot of work on where people essentially the paradigm is all pretty similar to what is described here. People are Receivers listen to cross-examinations and are asked to judge whether witnesses seem reliable or not. And again, they're pretty bad in doing that. 
And another thing, another reason I think this is different from lying is more a more theoretical one. Because again, what I think is going on is that when assessing others' memories, we engage in mentalizing social genetic consciousness. And it has been shown that, uh, that when we're trying to detect lying, we don't do it via mentalizing. Different mechanisms, part play, which. Is it really about? I mean, what do you capture here? I mean, usually we remember or not remember, but not, I mean, it's not frequently that we are asked to justify why or to verbalize why do we remember. Is the problem in our memory or in the way we justify what, you know, the, the way we verbalize yeah. it? So, first, I'm not sure there's a problem because we're, we're okay at doing that. If we're okay even with with the little data people have here, so then we're probably way better in actual life. And really, when when I wrote up uh, the grant and uh, started this work, I really tried to think of examples from real life where we do it because it specific it specifically has to do with recognition decisions. So if you just tell someone else about your memory, you might be able recalling you know, something that happened. You might like not, not choose to say anything about information you're not that sure about. So just describe what you're what you think is accurate and most likely is accurate. But there are, I think, quite a lot of cases in which, even in recall, but there it's harder to disentangle it, but where you ask the question, a yes, no question, or a recognition uh, question, where did you leave, where did you leave the keys? Are you really sure you left the keys there? And so on, and, and, and in many other contexts. So I forgot to say, which I really say in the very beginning. So of course in legal context, right? People are asked recognition, uh, recognition uh, questions. And also in many other cases, so when you go like to, to a doctor to be to diagnosed, I just took my, uh, my daughter a few months ago to uh, ADHD diagnosis. And what the, doc what the person, do the doctor in that case, does is ask you many questions which are essentially yes, no. Does she forget things a lot? And what you do, what I do is, is actually give examples. I try to you know, remember cases like that. But you're right, I was really going back and forth, asking myself, is this like really something we do in real life? And I think the fact we are able to do it means that probably we do. But again, this is all very preliminary, and it's a great question. It bugged me a lot. <laughs> uh, so another, like the closest, when I went over the literature to try to see what has been done with regard to assessing others' memories, the closest I got was to what is called interpersonal reality monitoring. This is my last slide, so. <laughs> uh, this is work by Marshall Johnson, who came up with the term and did a lot of work on reality monitoring, so distinguishing between real memories and things we only imagined, thought about, read, and so on. And there's some work, very old work actually, looking at interpersonal reality monitoring, so assessing others' descriptions. But the reason I think this is different, that this has to do exactly with the last question, is because there it's, it's about about recall, so what people are asked to do in such paradigms, and we ran a, a very similar one as well, is describe a real memory versus an imagined memory, something that could happen in the future, something that might have happened. So in actual fact, this is sort of like closer thing to lying than really honestly trying to justify whether what you remember is with how confident or how accurate you think your actual memory is. In most paradigms, I mean, this is what has been done. And there's really, really nice work by uh, Elizabeth Loftus as well. But for some reason, the only studies I could find were from way back in the 80s and 90s. Um, oh, I promised it would be the last slide, but OK. So, so I'll keep my promise. 
and maybe open this up to questions. And if we still have time, I can talk a little, about, a little bit more about implications of this work that's really only starting. But yeah, I forgot I had three additional slides, but I can stop here and open this up for questions and maybe get to present these slides in response to your questions. Um, okay, so this is what you, you're missing. And uh, thank you all for listening. And thanks to my collaborators, collaborators I didn't mention, throughout the talk. This actually was, this work was a result of a seminar, a graduate level seminar I ran, I, I taught last semester. So these, are, so these are the people who were part of the, se of the seminar. And Yuval Bittel from uh, Computer Science at Ben Boyon who helped a lot with the language models. And Mars Moskovich was always an inspiration. Discussed this work with me and provided inspiration. So thank you all for the time. The, I mean, what is the end goal? I mean, to come up with a model that would be able to judge other people, uh, like a light detector that is not a... Like a memory detector. <laughs> memory detector. Well, it's almost like a light detector, right? I mean, uh, yeah, only... For, for, uh, like for legal? Yeah, right. so, uh, so as far as... Um, I have a slide on that. It's so as far as... So as far as practical implications, maybe the long-term goal is sort of develop a tool which might help in detection of accurate memories, and specifically understand what I like about this, the results, the initial results at least, is that really people capture different information. People are useful as well, so we just need to know what to ask them. So, so this is a, a very short description of the model. We think uh, we think we'll eventually be able to construct, and we want to add stuff. So, actual you know, language model, actual language features from various language models, as well as what we looked at in this. Inside presented explicit assessments and opinion ratings, but also looked at how other features, other types of information might affect the might affect the way the might affect the justifications or the information conveyed in the justifications. So I'll, I'll go back a slide, a slide or two. So I think one of the questions that interests me, me most is whether we, okay, so we can assess others' memories, but maybe we're not as good or we're more biased at doing that depending on the others' social demographics uh, characteristics, their neurodiversity status, and so on. And this, as I think, this ability to assess others' memories really relies on mentalizing. The way we can look about at it is by very mentalizing, manipulating or very mentalizing performance. And the main idea is actually the last one, I think. So it's not just about the, the receiver and the witness in separation. It's about the interaction between them. So we're better at mentalizing the more similar the person is to us in various, various dimensions, which really is a lot of work in trying to understand these dimensions, uh, these dimensions better, but, but we're grounded in work that has been done in the context, a lot of work that has been done in the context of mentalizing. Um, but also we want to look at uh, what the PhD student, we now really the first, very first step at looking at populations whose mentalizing capacities are reduced. How diplomatic was I? <laughs> um, or different from us. So manipulating this both among witnesses and among receivers and looking at interactions between them. So this is 
one thing. And the other thing is looking at more situational factors that might affect, that might affect these uh, justifications and their assessment, like forgetting, which is one of the main reasons why our memories aren't accurate. And I won't get into the data, but we have pilot data showing that justifications don't seem to be affected so much by time, even though it's, uh, the long delay there was just uh, around 15 minutes. So this is what we see here, justifications after, you can't really see it, after a short delay and after a long delay in the x-axis. The features of the words in this case, most common two justifications in each condition are very, there's a, lot, a large overlap between justifications in the short delay and long delay conditions. So the closer these features are to the diagonal, the more overlap there is between the two conditions. So it seems that really people give the same justifications then let me explain this in simpler terms, give the same kind of justifications, use the same words to describe, to justify the memories after short and long delays. And what we're interested in doing is, first of all, looking at, the, at much longer delays, more ecologically valid delays, with a more ecologically valid paradigm, going away, moving away from the wordless paradigms. And, and also seeing what, so if it does, whether it's still, affects assessment in the same way. So we see that the, the content of justifications doesn't change, but it might be that if the idea, the concept of forgetting is sort of in people's, in receivers' mind, they might still be more biased or even maybe more accurate in their assessment of justification. So this is, so all these and other features we think we might be able to be added and augment a model distinguishing between them. But it's more like this part, more basic science, like theoretical, what, what is information? That was a very long answer. <laughs> more informative, right. More informative, and then who's gonna benefit from that or the, the language models or the, yeah, or the right. people, and, and will they still have some differential uh, generation from the text? Or yeah, wow, excellent question. That's a good question. So, so what we think is, is going along with these lines exactly, so presenting like movies or short movies and ask the questions about that and, and hopefully then the justifications would be way richer, longer and more informative. And another thing that I think it would help us do it, which we were not able to do here, is look also at justifying what we, we don't, we, no, we think wasn't there. So here we only ask questions that were, uh, the answer to which was yes. The word was in the list or the, uh, and not the word wasn't in the list. But sometimes we asked, especially in consequential you know, legal settings, was that person in the room or whatever? And we can justify why we think we don't know, we, we don't remember seeing that person. So, and the reasons we are able to justify is because we, like, thinking of the, the party example, we can give reasons okay, I remember she wasn't at that party because I found it surprising. She's a very good friend with the person whose party it was and was, so when it's grounded in more like some kind of you know, uh, knowledge, prior knowledge or, or something, because in, in this experiment, in the uh, Dobbins experiment, we had misses and, uh, and correct rejections, but it didn't make any sense to even look at their justifications because they were all things like, I don't remember that word. I just don't remember that word. That was equally common for mis and correct rejections. But I think when we can give we people reasons to be more informative about saying, no, I don't remember that. And the other thing is, if we do that, we also, it might be also useful to look at more complex and also more, even more interpretable models, because 
with these texts, with these specifications that were really shor short, so we ran like more advanced models like, uh, like BERT, like Google's, uh, Google's model on them, and it, there wasn't anything, anything there. But for longer texts, we can use more specific models. Sorry again, very long. More questions? No, we should. Thank you. Speaker again. Thank you.